Piracy is nothing new to the internet, nor is it unfamiliar to the games industry. Pretty much since the dawn of digital media, there have always been entities that seek to copy and disseminate it free of charge. It's almost an inevitable element to anything digital that costs money. There are plenty of arguments for and against it, and of course, many moral quandaries surrounding it. Regardless of whatever side of the fence you stand, it's likely here to stay. No matter your particular medium, be it video games, mp3s, movies, or footage of the spicy variety, there often exists a vast community of so-called pirates copying and sharing and discussing various digital media. Like any community regardless of size, there is usually specific players that become icons within the group. Sometimes they last, and often their recognition comes and goes. This is a story about a particular player within the scene, an enigmatic individual who has seen all sorts of notoriety throughout their online career. She goes by Empress, and she is a game cracker. Uh, hey, come look at the site. Oh, cool. Can you download the Foo Fighters? Uh, yeah. Hold on. First of all, let's front load this story with a discussion about online digital piracy and how Empress fits into this whole puzzle, because the story is a little complicated. Known as peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, the primary means of distributing all of these files is also familiar to most of us. Pretty much everyone on the internet for an extensive period of time has torrented something in their lives, so it comes with no surprise that this is primarily how this media is shared. Torrents are also notoriously difficult to fight against. Many companies have tried and failed to stop torrents at their property, simply based on the fundamentals of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. You can shut down a website, and you can sue an individual, but you can't stop the horde, especially with all the modern tools to dodge or break the protections. Speaking of breaking protections, the difficulty or complexity of sharing specific kinds of digital goodies does differ depending on what exactly it is. For example, Sharing a movie or a song, even an ebook, is often quite easy because it's one measly file which will work for nearly 100% of the people that download it. Video games, on the other hand, are a different kind of beast altogether. Considering a game is made up of usually a metric fuckton of files working together to deliver the experience we gamers indulge in, the code can get confusing or complicated. This also provides the developer an opportunity to essentially booby trap their game. When this happens, skilled hackers, coders, or programmers work tirelessly to undo. When the pitfall is disarmed, the devs are forced back to brainstorm new and better tactics to fight back. Even in the era of cassettes and then videotapes, there existed this battle between the industry and those so-called pesky pirates. In the video game space, this has even extended to consoles over the generations, especially since the age of CDs and DVDs. Pirates would get their hands on a console, take an original Xbox for example, and work to break the measures that prevent it from reading or playing pirated content. In this particular case of the Xbox, and often other consoles too, it also unlocks even more potential for the console which was not originally intended by the developers, which adds even more to the whirlwind of debates surrounding the topic of piracy. Simply put, this war of wits has been waging for decades and has only gotten more and more complicated. Digital pirates prefer to work in tight and cohesive crews called wares groups. Together, the plethora of wares groups form an enigmatic globe-spanning network that is known as the scene. There is no leader, and instead there is a strict rule set. The adherence to the regulations is what keeps the scene together. Basically, if any member's release were to break the rules, other members would be quick to quote-unquote nuke the release, which essentially means flagging it as bad content. The rule set will vary for each scene category, whether it be MP3s, TV, or movies, but it is created by the groups themselves. These groups are in a fierce perpetual competition to be the first to crack and release a piece of media. Because after the product is cracked for the first time, most other releases lose credibility or are seen as inferior for whatever reason. Because of this, the competition is cutting edge and really involves a challenge for the groups participating. Due to the free nature of these releases, and some of them involve some incredibly expensive pieces of work, the groups have developed an image for themselves akin to a modern Robin Hood. 
and there is some truth to this, but does not really encapsulate the motivations of these pirates. They don't do it for philanthropy. It's all about the competition, baby. It takes some seriously developed skills and work to pirate this media, and everyone is trying to be the very best. I wanna be the very best. It's an addictive game for those in the scene, and since it's free and piracy profiteering is widely discredited and absolutely taboo, these groups don't do it for the money. But there is something to be said about the prestige. From time to time, certain entities rise and fall and develop some form of varying notoriety. Empress is one of these individuals, but groups like Reloaded or Skid Row also serve as examples of pirates amassing a following and gaining prestige, certainly within the scene. Consisting of thousands of active groups, some coming and going, some dominating for a while and then fading away, it truly is a big deal with any of these groups, let alone an individual, can last for an extended period of time. Participation in the scene comes with great risk too, considering that piracy is against the law the world over, especially for those crackers. For a long while, things were going good, but there always existed people in the scene getting busted for all sorts of different crap. But the scene would always endure, giving the gaming industry in particular a run for its money. The industry looks at piracy as enemy number one in most cases. The prevailing approach to piracy is that each pirated unit is a lost sale, and developers and publishers alike took a stern approach to piracy as they viewed it as the greatest threat to their bottom line. They implemented various coding traps in their games to prevent, deter, and in the case of a literal miracle, eliminate piracy of their content. With varying rates of success, the scene completely outperformed the industry and pretty much everything would be cracked in due time, and usually quite quickly. However, over time, the gaming industry has ballooned into an incredibly valuable industry that brings even Hollywood to its knees. Because of this monolithic rise in capital, the gaming industry could now afford to invest in their ultimate trap card. You triggered my trap card! Enter Digital Rights Management, or DRM. Specifically, a little piece of code called Denuvo. Up until 2014, the scene was really chugging along with great success. Most big games were cracked with relative ease and pirates all over the world were enjoying their splendors. It was a different time for the scene. And as usual, some players made a name for themselves and really enjoyed displaying their skills. Then one fateful day, in 2014, a company from Austria would develop a DRM and anti-tamper technology system known as Denuvo. Tech would quickly be adopted by the gaming industry as a means to protect their property from piracy. And unfortunately for the scene, it was widely successful, at least relative to the industry's previous measures. The first game to use Denuvo Anti-Tamper was FIFA 15, released way back in September 2014. Upon release, Denuvo's perception within the scene was as but another hurdle to be jumped, but this image quickly faded as it presented itself to be much more of a difficult challenge. You see, Denuvo is intentionally designed to be cryptic and confusing to understand. I'm probably going to butcher a description of how it works, but here it goes anyway. The process involves basically encrypting and shuffling the code contained in the game's boot file, the .exe, and then decrypting it in real time. Denuvo's servers, along with data from the user's computer, are used to assist in this decryption process. Upon the initial launch of the game, it will adapt itself to the unique hardware configuration of the computer, which serves as a type of identifier. This enables the software to detect if it has been transferred to another device or if any unauthorized modifications have been made to the .exe. Denuvo couldn't have come at a better time for the industry, and its impact was colossal. For a long time leading up to 2014, games were being cracked within days and sometimes hours of release, and then the industry was in real dire straits. Then this little, and probably expensive, chunk of code could prevent your game from being cracked for months, and oftentimes years. It was such a huge deal, and some people in the scene viewed it as impenetrable. Though Denuvo Software Solutions has publicly acknowledged that every protected game will inevitably be cracked. What set Denuvo apart from the pack was that it could greatly extend the window of time it takes for a product's protection to be defeated. This was important as the industry was operating on data that supported the fact that most sales for major games happen within 30 days of that game's release. 
This meant that De Nouveau was seen as a great success as it protected games way outside this windows and in some cases vastly beyond this time frame. Of course, De Nouveau is in constant development so the software becomes harder and harder to crack with each new iteration, so those players within the scene need to keep their skills sharp and also be constantly learning how this specific piece of code works. The first to publicly claim to have defeated De Nouveau's protections was a Chinese wares group known as 3DM, in a blog post on December 1st, 2014. They had announced they would release cracked versions of De Nouveau protected games. After this announcement, the group delivered, cracking and releasing Dragon Age Inquisition approximately two weeks after the game had shipped. The process took about a month, which was abnormally long for the scene at the time. Eventually, 3DM would announce they were giving up on trying to break the version of Denuvo for Just Cause 3, and feared that because Denuvo was becoming so widely adopted, there would be quote, no more free games to play in the world in the near future. Thankfully to the scene, these prophecies wouldn't come to fruition. It seems that no matter what the obstacle you put in front of these guys, they'll find a way regardless of the odds. While De Nouveau remained an overall success, the rates would begin to vary greatly, and pirates would go on to break many De Nouveau protected games a lot quicker. However, things within the scene were different. There were now far fewer groups with the skills necessary to break these protections, and while some could still do it, their numbers were scarce, and when these games got cracked, it was usually a big deal. Really, once 3DM disappeared from the scene in 2016, the only real group with any hope of breaking De Nouveau was CPY. Nearly 100% of the releases following the cracking of Tomb Raider 2016, after 193 days, were coming from CPY. This was an historical moment for the scene considering CPY was quite literally the only group who stood capable of defeating De Nouveau. They lorded over the scene like no one else before. Their status as scene overlords lasted about a year as nothing would be cracked without their input. Thankfully, CPY would eventually begin collaborating with more and more groups further disseminating the skills and tricks required for fighting against De Nouveau. The saga of De Nouveau isn't as simple as a thorn of the side of pirates in the scene. There's actually a hotly contested debate surging around the topic of DRM and its impact on games. In the games industry's eyes, the argument is simple, and the efficacy of specifically De Nouveau is clear. To them, the proof is in the pudding, and they want to sell as much pudding as possible, which is hard to argue against. It is their property after all. Developers and publishers invest tons of time and capital into their products and no doubt deserve to sell those properties for a profit. However, those in and outside the scene have incredibly valid arguments from their side as well. It is widely accepted that De Nouveau impacts the performance of a game, though it is not exactly known to the extent to which this plays out. Some claim De Nouveau increased load times drastically or that it took a greater toll on hardware. There's also great concern surrounding the potential devastating ramifications of the software will have on games preservation and ownership. Overall, the debate is complex and no one side is totally right here, but the importance of this debate is that it draws more eyes into DRM from the greater gaming community, which feels the image that some of these players within the scene cultivate with their work. Players like CPY, Codex, and of course, our true subject of today's tale, Empress. With all that explained and on the table, the stage is set for the telling of the legend of a cracker in the scene known as Empress. This cracking prodigy's rise to the top came with no surprise, it was more of a step-by-step -step conquest, and at first she jumped into the scene using the pseudonym C000005, having a history of collaborating with the popular cracker Codex. She began to develop a reputation for herself through her first Anuo cracks under the moniker of Empress. These came as part of collaborations throughout 2017. Empress would continue to build her name within the scene with three collabs in 2017 and five in 2018, and eventually she would go on to a solo debut with her cracked version of Planet Zoo, which made a huge impact. This release would launch Empress into scene stardom, and for the period of 2020, October to July 2021, Empress was the new top dog. 
At this time, there were 15 major releases and Empress was responsible for 8 of them. Over half. A lot of these games were high profile titles too, like Mortal Kombat 11, and importantly, Red Dead Redemption 2. She was unstoppable. Empress was a total wildcard within the scene, a player the likes of which had never been witnessed in the space. A complete outlier in the scene, she drew attention that went beyond her skills as a cracker and extended to her image as well. She basically flipped the bird to all established conventions in the scene, and most crucial of all, she broke the rules. The Enigma didn't represent any group, she came out as one woman waging all-out warfare against the gaming industry. While she belonged to the scene, she rejected it. Her identity really stood out amongst these nerds. First of all, she was a woman, which, while not unheard of, was not common either. She also frequently shared her philosophical views, which by most standards, were pretty far out there. She also established her image by surrounding herself with what she claimed to be her true motivations which were all about saving game. Furthermore, Empress notably committed the scene's ultimate taboo, posting to the Crack Watch subreddit, and did it with reckless abandon. Ultimately, her skills spoke for themselves, but the cherry on top was the piracy community now essentially had their first glorified celebrity. There always existed this dichotomy of worlds, on one hand the piracy community, and on the other the scene, each complementing the other while only vaguely interacting. They cared only about one another's results, and not their motivations. The gamers didn't give one single flip about the Swears group's pursuit for clout, they wanted cracks. And the scene couldn't care less about what the piracy community was discussing, so long as they downloaded their releases. While the piracy community embraced and in some cases worshipped Empress, the scene hated her. But there was nothing they could really do about it. She was untouchable. Being one of the very few people in the world capable of breaking De Nuvo does come with its perks. Even in the instances the scene would nuke her releases, the fans would ignore the flag and download it anyway. Her online image was a perfect fit for the piracy community, which stood in stark contrast to the scene, which is where you'd correctly place Empress and her work. Though the rise of Empress is pretty clear cut, the main section of her career leading up to now is wrought with turbulence and drama which is totally interesting and frankly, entertaining. During the peak Empress times in 2021, she actually did an interview with the popular publication Wired, and this marks where the Empress saga really starts to pick up steam and go off the rails. In this interview, she kicks it off into high gear right at the start, unveiling how she came to be part of the scene. According to her, it all came from a dream, one fateful slumber in 2014. Chains composed of numbers wrapped tightly around a game you might know called Dark Souls 2. The numbers were code and it was anti-tamper software, probably Denuvo. She says she began to see what every number meant universally, and that she entered the zone, which allowed me to see more into everything. Then the chains broke. Talk about a call to arms. Need to wake. Now for wrath. Now for ruin. And the red dawn. Oh, like Banting waking up from his dream to fight diabetes and create insulin, Empress woke up that morning to wage a war against a disease of a digital variety, DRM. Also in the interview, Empress explains her motivations saying that she is doing it to save games, viewing them as the penultimate form of art. She claims to have a goal no one else has and that she has no need for ego. The Cracker goes on to reiterate that she is a woman, saying she was 23 years old and beautiful as hell. Whether you believe it or not, there are nuggets of truth here. She does behave in a way no Cracker ever really has. Keep in mind, due to the illegal nature of these people's work, their identity is shrouded in mystery, and almost 100% of the time, there are a lot of measures taken to obfuscate their identity. Empress is no exception to this, and so there is no way to really discern any objective truth about what she says about her personal views or identity. The only thing about these members of the scene that can be considered real in any sense are their behaviors and actions. Even then, especially if you're into conspiracies, actions can easily be seen as a way to further sow discord. 
It could be that the vast majority of what Empress says about herself is totally fabricated, simply on the basis of shielding her true identity, and of course, adding fuel to her raging cult of personality. Yours really is an attractive quality. Thank you. It was either that or get my hair highlighted. Smugness is easier to maintain. The controversy around Empress seemed to build and bubble with every new release or post. She definitely knows how to stir some shit up. In her releases, she often included long and deep diatribes about her quote unquote philosophy. She developed and then doubled down on this idea that she had the perfect and totally correct answer to all philosophical questions. In her first post, that was mostly about philosophy, she said, I have always had lots of universal philosophy knowledge inside my soul, and it always opposes the famous philosophers and thinkers theories and pretty much everyone else on this planet. Needless to say, this was the beginning of the contention surrounding Empress, and it would only heat up over time. People in the community were furious with how special Empress thought she was, and not to mention incredibly arrogant. While some were pissed, many others were quick to retort the simple truth. Bitch shut up, they pirated RDR2. Which at the end of the day was totally true. Adam Smith or Nietzsche couldn't deliver the same way Empress could. Say what you will about her philosophy, Empress was a breed of her own. And after these posts, the veil around her mental state began to lift. It seemed to no surprise that Empress was really far out there in her beliefs and outlook on reality. But really, it shouldn't have. There's a reason that now, in 2023, there's virtually only one person in the world who can break the nouveau in the scene. The software is so complicated and developed by some ridiculously smart and talented programmers that you'd have to be insane to even take a crack at it. It could only be someone like Empress who's capable of doing the work that she does. It was always going to be her. Now, I'm not nearly intelligent enough to understand this completely, but she does say that she breaks de novo by fusing philosophy with coding, and as vague as that is, maybe there's some truth to the statement considering she's the only person who can break the nouveau. So if it is the case, it must be successful. Either way, the philosophy Empress posted about was in the pirate community, and many began discussing banning her or some other measures to eject her from the community. On top of the arrogance on display with her posts about philosophy, her views began to be seen as transphobic as well. Empress would also go nuclear on anyone who disagreed with her philosophy. She said one time, I suggest you all go for a self-recheck. You people have stinking shallow minds and souls. My philosophy is the universal type, and the term subjective means nothing in my world. If you're still not convinced and disagree of anything I said in this post, I congratulate you because it means you didn't understand a single word from what I said. Please enjoy an empty, pathetic life. Empress would go on to make her own platform, at first with moderate success, and eventually settle on a subreddit and telegram to communicate with her follower of fans. While today her reddit account and the subreddit have been banned due to community guideline violations, her telegram is still active. While her subreddit was online, she would make regular posts about either her philosophy or her work, and it was a good way to see what she was up to. Empress's, let's say, unique philosophical views weren't the only thing that pushed people away from and contributed to the controversy surrounding her. It quickly became clear she was no expert at making friends. Every move the programmer made, there would always be some people that were angry about it. There was a particular moment in Empress's career that became one of the most divisive and unusual moves she would ever make to date. She began asking for financial compensation for her cracks. What complicated this was that she was in the unique position to leverage her skills to ask for money. Under normal circumstances, when a scene cracker would ask for money, everyone would nuke them and leechers would simply move on to more acceptable groups. These weren't your standard conditions, however. Empress was in her own caliber and quite frankly the only person capable of breaking de novo. Whether you agree with it or not, the simple fact was she did it because she could. First, in September 2020, Empress came out publicly on Reddit and primed her audience. She basically said that the scene was dead and that no one could break the nouveau besides her. While this had already become common knowledge, we finally had it straight from the horse's mouth. And you only had to look at the work being done in the scene to confirm this. 
When Empress left Codex, it was clear she was the only Genuvo Cracker they had, and a lot of the releases from other groups were also done by Empress, so when she went off on her own solo adventure, it became clear who was doing most of this work. What wasn't known at the time is that this post was simply fluff, a way to cushion the impact of her next post. In her next post, she came out and explicitly asked for money and donations for her to crack Denuvo protected games. Empress claimed that in order to fight Denuvo, she would have to wholly dedicate herself to the pursuit, and this required financing. People were pissed, and some pointed out that piracy shouldn't be about profit, but instead about the games, the ideology, and the competition. But Empress made it clear that she didn't care for any of that besides ideology. In her mind, she was fighting a war with the games industry, and like any war, it needed money to feed the machine. Now as I mentioned, within the scene, asking for money or donations was strictly forbidden. It wasn't totally unheard of however, as groups like Codex had asked for money in the past, among others. Another obvious component to the controversy was that the pirate community were pirates for a reason. There are plenty of arguments for piracy sure, but the primary reason people pirate digital content is because it's free. Needless to say, this started to really ruffle feathers throughout the scene and the pirate community alike. Quickly, other wares groups fired back in their own releases, usually being highly critical of Empress and usually resorting to ad hominem attacks. But Empress always was locked and loaded and would respond with decent arguments. For example, when Darksiders shit all over Empress in their crack for Iron Harvest, she responded in kind, They must understand, I do not care about their shitty competition. We are not talking here about making profit from cracking itself. We are talking about saving the right to preserve your games and own them. Because in current days, no matter how much money you have, you simply cannot buy true ownership anymore. She makes it very clear once again, while she may have been a senior by definition, Empress was doing this for her own motivations, or at least so she says. It is a sad truth that she touches on in her response, the fact that games preservation and ownership are at threat. The problem, however, is that because all of this is shrouded in anonymity and nothing can truly be confirmed objectively, all you had was Empress's word that these were her true intentions. The whole donation thing wasn't just as innocuous as asking for compensation. Empress would actively hold her work hostage from the community, demanding at least 500 bucks before she released it or even worked on the crap. Business bad? Fuck you, pay me. Oh, you had a fire? Fuck you, pay me. It was a little shady to say the least, but she made an argument attempting to justify herself. Surely a small donation of 500 bucks was barely any compensation for the amount of work that would go into breaking Denuvo protection for just one game. However, the fact of the matter was that basically since its inception, the scene had always forbade financial compensation. Empress would press on and eventually try allowing her fans to decide how they wanted the donating process to go, which quickly spiraled out of control. A little while after, Empress would go unhinged again and start being really sneaky. When Empress released her crack for Ubisoft's Immortals Phoenix Rising, she deliberately, without telling anyone, throttled her own seed box, or torrent. She responded by kicking up a whole new hornet's nest. According to her, she throttled the torrent because she was concerned about others in the scene re-uploading and repacking her releases. Another section about video game piracy in the scene is that there are players known as repackers. These guys take the cracks and heavily compress them, throw in some easy to use installer and in some cases trainers, mods and updates as well. They're a pretty important part of the piracy community worldwide as their primary leecher base is of people who have a problem downloading larger file sizes. These repackers were the primary target of Empress's rage fueled tirade and justification for throttling her release. In her eyes, these repackers were stealing her limelight. I, I'm really happy for you. I'm going to let you finish. But Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time. This batshit crazy cracking prodigy just couldn't get enough. She had already been the talk of the town for like a year at this point, not to mention in a way that had never been seen before. And she still wanted to further monopolize her celebrity. It truly was a feat of insanity. This would all culminate with a response from an extremely popular repacker named Fit Girl, who was the primary repacker using Empress's releases to repack. In her response, she chastises Empress and emphatically decides she will no longer be repacking any of Empress's releases, therefore severing all ties to Empress. It seems the Queen got her wish. 
The critical part of this whole branch of the Empress Saga is that by this point, she had stated that she did not care about Ego. She had no need for it, apparently. However, her actions here paint a totally different picture and expose some real hypocrisy. Well, such is to be expected, not only in real life, but double and even triple for the world of digital piracy. Oftentimes throughout the scene, pirates believe themselves to be untouchable insofar as the law is concerned. These guys take extreme measures to hide or throw off all personal information about themselves, and most of the time it works. However, the truth is, companies like Denuvo, in cooperation with law enforcement, only need a few pieces of critical information to find you. And while the torrent was truly untouchable, the individual pirate was not. There was one event back in 2018 that reminded the scene that the very real threat of the law could come for them. It was revealed that a Bulgarian cracker named Voxy was arrested and then sued by Denuvo, and that his cracking career was over. He got sloppy, and he got cocky, simply put. But it served as a reminder that the effort put in to remain ghost was worth it, as if you got caught, it would all come crashing down. Throughout her time in the piracy hive mind, Empress was constantly reminded by fans and detractors alike to be careful. Especially when she made these very public moves out of left field, people feared she was exposing herself. She always promised she'd be safe, but eventually the law came knocking. Literally the day after Wired posted their article interviewing Empress, she made a post to Reddit using her handle u slash infinity goddess. In this post titled finally caught by the police, good job everyone, she centers out Fit Girl, Masquerade, and the Reddit community and states that her real address was leaked to the authorities and that they were going to drag her out of her home in less than an hour. She ends in with some cliche speech about passing on the torch, so to speak. This, however, obviously was complete bullshit. Everyone quickly tore down the logic of the post and while responses were divided, none of them were good. Two days later, an apparent another miracle from God would occur. Empress would reveal on her website that her lawyer got her out of trouble and she was making a triumphant return two days later. Apparently, the raid to arrest her was simply a routine police check. While this was all a complete farce, it became clear that this was Empress's weird way of apologizing to the piracy community, and it worked. She made a promise not to start any beef and be on her best behavior. Folks were really hoping this would be the turning point and Empress would continue to deliver the goods, all while keeping it contained. As anyone could have guessed, our hopes for a real Empress redemption would never come true. Following the absolute chaos that was all of 2021, things would quiet down heavily in the cracking scene for 2022. Of the 36 Denuvo productive games that were released that year, only one game was cracked, which was Dying Light 2. Truly, it was a bleak year, and it seemed to echo Empress's claims a year before about the scene being dead. There were of course releases throughout the year from various groups including Empress, but it was surprisingly quiet considering what had been going on for the past year. Also, by this time Empress and her cult had sequestered their way into their own subreddit and telegram, away from the more popular subreddits and pirate hangout spots on the net. Once the shadow of 2022 had moved into 23, Things started to heat up again. Empress locked her sights on Hogwarts Legacy, coming out February 10th of that year. Needless to say, the entire gaming community was highly anticipating this game, especially once the whole political debate around it entered the mainstream. If gamers the world over were awaiting Hogwarts Legacy, you can only imagine what the pirates were thinking, especially for an $80 game. We all wanted this game desperately, only it was blocked with the most recent iteration of Denuvo, version 17, so all of our chips were in one big Empress basket. A few days before the big release, Empress made a commitment on her Reddit or Telegram, stating that she will have Hogwarts Legacy cracked within 10 days. This crazy motherfucker did it in 8. Within 8 days, she broke the most intense DRM the world has ever seen, and then by 11 days completed testing and released her work publicly. It was a pirate's dream come true, and because of this astonishing piece of work, many in the community either forgot about or looked over Empress's statements and behavior in the past. As usual, the results spoke for themselves. 
Of course, we're coming off the heels of this release as I create this video, so there isn't much more to the Empress story beyond her work on cracking Hogwarts Legacy. But fear not, because I don't think her war is just over yet. There is another thing worthy of note to add about the Empress Saga that came quickly after her Hogwarts Legacy crack. On March 4th, 2023, she made a post to her telegram titled Cult Announcement. In this post, she reveals that she has created what she calls a cult designed to share her particular philosophical positions. I mean, while not entirely marketable, calling it a cult is entirely accurate. It's a pretty outlandish pitch, but to anyone familiar with Empress, let alone in her telegram, it's not a complete surprise. The real kicker here though is that she was accepting applications to join said cult, and the admins fee was, check this out, a thousand fucking dollars. Since then, the applications have been closed, so it's safe to assume that the spots are filled or Empress canned the whole thing. Either way, it's likely that any of these cult meetings will be very exclusive and private. She doesn't really indicate where any of this will play out either, so unless any of it spills out into the community, we may have little to no information on this front. Which sucks, because if I had a thousand dollars I didn't give a shit about, I would totally join this cult for pure entertainment and to satisfy my nosy proclivities. Oh, what would I do to be a fly on the wall in Empress's cult? Oh, back room. On it. Wait, Julio. So Watch out for- so Of course, the legend of Empress is a crucial point in the history of the scene. I know I've said it a few times now, but I can't stress enough how this kind of situation has never arose within the scene, not even close. Whether you're on her side or not, there's no denying how skilled this cracker truly is, and it's because of this skill that she can make the impact that she has. I mean, yes, she is very far out there with her views and such, but if it weren't for her skills, regardless of what she said, she wouldn't have made nearly the waves that she has. Even though Empress is very talented, there is another downside to her madness. Remember when I mentioned that in the early days of Denuvo, CPY was collaborating to share their cracking skills? Yeah, well, I don't think that's going to happen here, what with how abrasive and uncooperative Empress can be. Even her former wares group's codex finally went tits up after rumors circulated for a long time that Empress was their only Denuvo cracker, which, whether they'll admit it or not, is still likely true. Of course, due to the enigmatic nature of the scene, and pirates alike, there have been a number of various conspiracy theories revolving around Empress. Claims that she has worked, or works for, Denuvo have circulated for a while, but nothing has been verified. There are a lot of abnormalities to Empress's career in the scene, and her story serves as fuel for the crazy conspiracies that surround her. During peak Empress times of 2021, her career and time in the community zeitgeist played like a soap opera for digital pirates. I'll say it again for good measure, the scene has never witnessed anything like Empress before, and if she disappeared tomorrow for good, she would have still made valuable contributions and established her legacy to the scene. Personally, I find her story fascinating, and of course, she consistently delivers the goods, so like a good pirate, I'll just leech and see. Take care.